Okay, uh, why don't we get started here? Um, I'm Tom Dusterberg. I'm a senior fellow uh, here at the Hudson Institute. I work mostly on economic issues. I want to welcome all of you here today on this uh, first day of spring that we're celebrating. Um, and uh, I commend you for braving the spring day to come out here. Uh, 5G is our topic today. It's uh, been in the news quite a bit late, uh, lately from a trial balloon about uh, nationalization of the infrastructure uh, to a hostile takeover that was um, um, nixed by the uh, CFIUS committee. Um, it's an important subject both in terms of economics <clears throat> and national security. It's a key enabling technology for the digital economy of the future. Uh, it's important, I think, to promote its deployment domestically as a driver of the economy and to achieve consensus globally on standards and acceptable rules for its use. As we've seen of late, uh, there's considerable competition, especially, but not only, from China, and it is in the U.S. interest to use the responsible policies to maintain uh, the technological lead which it's had in the at least the third and fourth generations of wireless technology. Today we're going to explore some of these questions, the economic promise of 5G in, the, in a 21st century economy, the state of competition uh, for basic uh, and applied technologies, the challenge especially but not exclusively from China, um, and policies to promote the deployment of 5G. I want to, before going any further, thank the Innovation Alliance for support that made this event possible. So we have a distinguished audience, uh, or a panel, I'm sorry, we have a distingu audience distinguished audience as well, uh, a distinguished panel to explore these questions. And I'm going to introduce uh, each of them and allow each of them to uh, have five minutes or so, five to eight minutes to uh, give some opening remarks. Um, our first panelist is Carolyn Bartholomew, the Vice Chairman of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Uh, Vice Chairman Bartholomew has worked at senior levels in the U.S. Congress, serving as Council, Legislative Director, and Chief of Staff to uh, now House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. She was a professional staff member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence uh, and has served as a uh, legislative assistant to uh, Bill Richardson. Uh, she has particular expertise in U.S.-China relations, including issues related to trade, human rights, and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Carolyn received a BA from uh, the University of Minnesota, an MA from Duke, and a, a Juris Doctor degree from Georgetown. She and I worked together many years ago on the Internet Freedom Act of 1998. And I'm pleased to see her again and work together again with her. Um, our second panelist is Harold Fershgott Roth. Uh, he's the founder of his own consulting firm, Fershgott Roth Economic Enterprises. Harold, too, has had a distinguished career in uh, economic issues in, and particularly on communication and tele telecommunication issues where he and I got to know each other again, working on the uh, uh, Telecommunications Act of 1996. Um, he's had uh, affiliations with the American Enterprise Institute, where he wrote uh, a, a book, A Tough Act to Follow, uh, which chronicled the difficulties in implementing the uh, Telecommunications Act of 96. Uh, from 1997 to 2001, Harold served as the commissioner of the FCC um, he's one of the few economists to have served as a federal regulatory commissioner and the only one to served, who has served on the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, before going to the FCC, he was chief economist for the House Committee on Commerce and principal staff member on the Telecommunications Act to Chairman uh, Bliley. Uh, Harold uh, has written two other books. Uh, he has a PhD in economics from Stanford. Final panelist is Shane Tooze. Shane is the vice chair of the board of directors for the Internet uh, Foundation, uh, Internet Education Foundation, and vice chair of the Internet Governance Forum USA. She's a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, 
uh, managing the global internet strategy program that focuses on cybersecurity and internet, internet governance uh, as part of the AEI Center for the Internet Strategies. Uh, she's a uh, former uh, vice president of public policy and government relations for VeriSign. She's the chairman of her own consulting firm's um, Logan Circle Strategies. Is that right? She's also the co-author of a important AEI report from last year, uh, An American Strategy for Cyberspace, Advancing Freedom, Security, and Prosperity, which is available on their website. So uh, we'll turn uh, first uh, to Carolyn. Oh, we were starting uh, Harold. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can't read my own notes. I'm sorry. We're going to start with Harold, who is going to give us an overview of the economics importance um, and a little bit of background on uh, 5G. Harold. Thank you, Tom. And, and first of all, thank you for organizing this session. We're very pleased to be here today. Um, wireless services and wireless technology are a testament to the power of competition. These services were not set up by government fiat. They were developed by private companies in the United States and around the world. Uh, and the key driver of innovation in this field has been competition. Many companies vying for brand new markets and through that competition, uh, ways of getting ahead have been innovation. And that's been true uh, in what is essentially a global market for manufactured equipment. Services are provided more on a national level, but the manufacturing of equipment is entirely a global market. That market has worked very well for the past, let's say, 30 years. Uh, it has uh, rewarded innovation. Companies that do well survive and prosper. Companies that are less innovative, less competitive, do not. Uh, there have been challenges along the way and continue to be challenges related to intellectual property theft. Um, some companies come up with new ideas, other companies take those ideas. Uh, and there have been some litigation surrounding it, uh, and we, we all have a great deal of patent litigation here in the United States. I'm not going to go into that. But the consumers have benefited enormously from the development of the wireless industry and the innovations in that industry. Uh, I've, there have been many economic studies of those benefits. I've done some myself. Uh, in the United States alone, the value of the wireless industry, in addition to the two to three hundred billion dollars that consumers directly spend on wireless services, the consumer surplus is, uh, is a greater factor than that as well. So consumers have benefited enormously from this new innovation. Well, what is 5G? 5G is just a shorthand for fifth generation. And let's say the wireless industry has been around for about 30 years. Each generation of new technology has been given a number. And there have been 1 and 1.5 and 2 and 2.5, but um, you can say roughly there's been a new generation of wireless technology once every seven years or so. Right now, practically everyone in this room probably has uh, smartphone that's going to be 4G technology. The next generation is, is 5G, fifth generation. The past generations of technology, 1G through 4G, have been uh, what I would call almost incremental progressions from beginning with 1G, which was uh, analog voice service. And over time, we've had greater capacity, greater speeds, greater capabilities to have new innovative technologies applied on top of them. 5G is going to be very different from just the incremental progression. It's going to employ different bands of, of uh, spectrum, including high frequency bands that have never been used before, at least not used for commercial wireless purposes, multiple bands, greater data efficiency, and the idea is to develop new technologies with extraordinarily greater capacity for, for, data, for data capacity, uh, greater speeds, and, and less latency in the delay. Um, there is no, as of yet, 
and there probably never will be a single technological standard for 5G. Uh, standard setting bodies in the United States, the IEEE, and other standard setting bodies around the world are looking at new technologies and different bands of spectrum, all of which fall under the broad rubric of 5G. Some of these will be commercially available beginning next year. Many of them may not be commercially available for many more years. Uh, if the average lifespan of uh, prior technologies was seven years, my hunch is 5G is going to be a longer, longer lived lifespan. Well, why is um, uh, 5G important? I think it's going to be different from prior generations in part because of the interconnectedness of 5G. 5G is going to be implanted in practically every consumer electronic device, everything from refrigerators and dishwashers to automobiles. It will play an important role in new technologies such as automated vehicles and drones. Uh, and um, uh, the, the characteristic that all of these have is a, an interconnectedness. Some call it Internet of Things. There, there are other ways of thinking about that. Now, some people may ask the question from an economic perspective, does it matter whether the technology for 5G resides or is controlled in the United States or not? And, and let me just give a counterexample, which 30 years ago in the 1980s, there was a great deal of consternation in the United States about television manufacturing technology and the migration of television manufacturing technology to Japan. A lot of storm and drang about what should be done, uh, and uh, ultimately there, there was no particular intervention, and lo and behold, 30 years later, no one really much notices. There, there is no American manufacturing of um, television sets of any significance, um, and it's, it's all gone abroad. But 5G may be different. And the reason that it may be different is as follows. One is there's a potential for uh, a single company to control 5G technology, and that would be Huawei in China. Arguably, they are already way ahead of most other uh, uh, chip manufacturers and, and aggregators in, in this space. They certainly have a very large share of the initial market space. Um, but there are other companies that, that compete in this space, and they have uh, a great deal of potential as well, uh, including some American companies. Second, implanting 5G technology in almost all consumer electronic devices uh, creates an interconnectedness that may give 5G a very different market effect than prior generations of wireless technology, which pretty much were standalone pieces of equipment, much like the smartphone in your, in your pocket. Um, the third reason is that there are, we're on the cusp of new technologies, the, the, the aut autonomous vehicles, the drones, uh, and practically all new forms of technology are going to be dependent on 5G. And so controlling 5G, if it were to evolve to be a single provider of 5G technology, that would put that company in an extraordinarily uh, advantageous position in the market. So uh, that's kind of the economic overview of where we are. I'm going to return to, to Tom for our next speaker. Um, OK, now we're going to turn to Carolyn. Yeah. Carolyn's a longtime observer of Chinese uh, <laughs> politics, uh, political ambitions, and their efforts to move up the uh, technology ladder, especially in the manufacturing um, arena. And she's an expert on the uh, variety of strategies, shall we say, that the Chinese deploy. Could you comment on, on the current Chinese ambitions uh, related to 5G? what tactics they're using, and the possible consequences. Absolutely. Thanks. And like Harold, I'd like to thank the audience for showing up today. And Tom, thank you for including me on this distinguished panel. Uh, just a couple of thoughts that came into my head as, as Harold was speaking. Uh, he mentioned IP theft. Of course, what, what had been experienced in terms of IP theft in 
previous decades was not really uh, necessarily a government-directed strategy uh, and certainly a, a way to ensure that it was a reduction in R&D cost, which is one of the tactics that China has used. And I think it's important for people to, to think about why, why is it that we are so concerned about China. I mean, China is not Japan. It's not Norway. It's not Germany. It's not some of the other countries that are working on some of these technologies. They are um, providing, I believe, sort of a, a fundamental threat to the way we do things, to, to our values, and to the political system, the social and political system that we have. Um, the Chinese government is determined that it will be a leader in the development and deployment of next generation connectivity, innovation, and technology, 5G. Um, and it's employing a full range of industrial policy, policies to attain that position. Um, there's variations on this, but, but the Chinese have, have said, certainly Chinese leaders have said, in, T, in 2G, we followed. In 3G, we caught up. In 4G, we ran head to head. And in 5G, we will lead. There have been a few recent reports that they're already working on 6G before 5G is even implemented. Um, China is already the world's largest manufacturer of interconnected devices and technologies, the Internet of Things, as Harold said, and a global leader in network equipment manufacturing. China's commitment to 5G leadership has significant consequences for US competitiveness, for our national security, including control of and access to US critical infrastructure and sensitive information and data privacy. In terms of competitiveness, 5G's superior connectivity will spur innovation and economic growth. There are some estimates. They seem kind of wild, but IHS has estimated that 5G networks will enable $12.3 trillion in global economic output and support 22 million jobs by 2035. Of course, if we've learned anything about the, the, the era of internet technology, it's how things unfold isn't necessarily how we think they're going to unfold, but those are pretty amazing numbers. China's state-directed approach to technology development limits market opportunities for foreign firms in China and gives Chinese companies advantages that US and other companies do not have. China is not a free market economy, and this is not a level playing field. And I always think it's important to remind people of that. At the same time, the Chinese government is really clear about its plans, and it lays them out for the world to see in its five-year plans and other initiatives it's, it's developed, like Made in China 2025. We have seen in sector after sector how the Chinese government's commitment to build its own industries is carried out successfully through subsidies on everything from R&D to land and energy, through IP theft, forced technology transfer, localization targets and government procurement, promotion of Chinese standards and tariff barriers, among others. The Chinese government is protectionist, and we ignore that at our peril. So global leadership in 5G is important for China as it moves up the value-added manufacturing chain, as it asserts and ex expands its presence on the global stage, and as it seeks to control the flow of information. The Chinese government is actively engaged in strategic support for 5G, the Internet of Things, and AI, using comprehensive industrial plans, using significant state funding for domestic firms, just want to go through a few numbers. In November of 2014, the 863 plan in China uh, provided more than $46 million dollars worth of Chinese funding in 5G tech. Through the five-year plan, the 12th five-year plan, which was 2011 to 2015, more than $24 billion was provided to Internet of Things development. And in the 13th five-year plan, Chinese government funding to the sector includes $3 billion in an advanced manufacturing fund and $6 billion in an emerging industries investment fund. There's also strong financial support for 5G network deployment. Um, China there is aggressively competing to be the first country to deploy 5G networks in multiple cities, which will help it corner the market on IP licensing fees. The Chinese Academy of Information and Communications Technology estimated that China, through China Mobile, China Unicom, China Telecom, Huawei, and ZTE, will invest $445 billion in 5G networks from 2020 to 2030. China also limits market access for foreign competitors. 
Chinese government. The Chinese government has guaranteed Huawei and ZTE each a third of domestic 5G network contracts. It also restricts cross-border data transfer, which will limit the value of Internet of Things devices. U.S. firms wanting to participate are required to form JVs and to store Chinese customer data in China, giving the advantage to Chinese firms in data analytics, technology optimization, and integrated global services, as well as in R&D. And China also uses localization tar targets. So Made in China 2025 seeks to increase domestic market share of Chinese branded communication network equipment to 80% by 2025. This is a coordinated strategy, government-driven coordinated strategy in order to promote Chinese, the competitiveness of Chinese firms. After failed attempts at establishing Chinese standards as global ones for 3G and 4G, the Chinese government learned some lessons and has changed its tactics for 5G, utilizing what it's learned in other international fora to gain influence in standards development. It's been steadily increasing its influence at the ITU, now controlling the secretary general position. Huawei and China Mobile served as chair and vice chair of the 2015 ITU 5G focus group. At 3GPP, the Chinese are slowly and steadily increasing their leadership positions. The US, of course, as a matter of, of the way we do things, has a more hands-off approach to setting international standards. But those participating in establishing a single international standard for 5G um, will see accrual of higher revenues from intellectual property, gain greater bargaining power over established market leaders like Qualcomm, and global influence over subsequent wireless technology standards. It's important, again, to remember that in China, no companies are truly private. Huawei likes to say that it's a private company. But uh, President Xi's socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new age, he's overseeing what is an increasing control over, sector, all, all, over all sectors in the economy. As he has, has consolidated power, he has reasserted the role of the Chinese Communist Party in private companies. More than two-thirds of so-called private companies, both Chinese and foreign, now host Communist Party cells and committees. CCP cadres sit on work councils and fill leading positions in personnel and government relations departments. Again, that's both in state-owned enterprises and so-called private companies. And technology and telecommunications companies are part of the CCP's political agenda. Um, Lexanova, a US IPR law firm, estimates that China in total already owns about 10% of 5G essential IPRs. Huawei has most of them, followed by ZTE. There are other tools that China uses, has in its toolkit to help domestic companies and hurt foreign companies. One is a rather comprehensive cybersecurity law. Among the many provisions there uh, the, is one related to data storage. Um, the law requires IT hardware and services to undergo inspection and verification as secure and controllable before companies are allowed to deploy them in China. This requirement, of course, tilts purchasing decisions towards Chinese companies. And then there's China's anti-monopoly law. China has, according to the US Chamber of Commerce, employed the anti-monopoly law both domestically and territorially, extraterritorially, to pursue essentially industrial policy objectives. Chinese enforcement agencies appear to use the threat of the AML investigations against foreign actors in order to control price and supply of goods to the benefit of Chinese market participants. China's AML allows for the consideration of non-competitive factors, namely industrial policy, in its application and enforcement. As part of an overhaul of China's government bureaucracy, basically just announced last week, proposals were submitted to the National People's Congress to merge China's three antitrust authorities into a new state administration for market supervision. As with much of China's legal and regulatory framework, there's not a lot of transparency and much is unknown. Change is expected to be gradual, however, Merging the agencies involved in AML will remove one of the barriers to China's more stringent use of AML law, which has been bureaucratic turf and inter-institutional competition. Foreign businesses should be prepared to face more formidable challenges. 
The stated objective of the reform is to create a unified market oversight system in order to establish an open, orderly, and fair competitive market in China. But like many of the reforms of the past years, we should expect that they will be shaped to protect China's industries and companies and make it harder for American companies. Enforcement will be enhanced by streamlining bureaucracy, and there could well be an increased role for the consideration of public and national interest interventions, which would tilt toward protecting China's national champion industries, including telecommunications. It's also being rumored that one of the main contenders to lead the new agency is the man who was the director general of the NDRC antitrust branch, under whom the Qualcomm investigation began, which resulted, as many of you know, in a fine of, a, of, for a fine of Qualcomm of around $975 million. In addition to the economic issues, I just I want to touch briefly, I know my time is up, but I want to touch briefly on issues related to US national security and data privacy. 5G is going to facilitate um, uh, more interconnectedness, as Harold said, which means the possibility of connecting more, of collecting more data from people is very real. And China is engaging now in uh, significant investments in artificial intelligence, domestic surveillance, facial recognition. Basically, they are aiming for a society in which nobody in China will be able to go from point A to point B without it being known where they're going, who they're talking to, and, and, and what they're doing, what they're up to. Um, Many people in this country, in our country, don't understand, don't think about, or maybe are not concerned about the, the, the collection of data on their individual lives. I think when you put the collection of data into this context and what that data is being used for, it's something that we should all be concerned about. So 5G will facilitate this growth of things. There are estimates that 5.5 million new devices are coming online every day, um, and it will magnify the vulnerabilities that all of us have on a personal, government, and a societal level. Um, so these social credit systems that China is creating, it's a system where everything that you do, from potentially online gaming, the games that your children play, how they play them, um, whether, whether you pay your rent on time, what you've, what you've, bur what you've purchased, all of those things are, are supposed to be being aggregated into a system that will sort of rank you in terms of how, how good of a patriot you are, how good of a person you are. China's collecting vast amounts of, of um, health data, of genetic data. It's, it's, it's just this big complex of collection of information, which, which I think that 5G will facilitate. It's something I think we need to be concerned about with that. I've talked a lot. <laughs> All right, Carolyn, you, you gave us a huge amount of stuff to think about. Um, I want to let Shane um, weigh in here. She's written on a broad variety of topics uh, uh, relevant to the discussions about 5G, its future, how, how to make sure it gets deployed, what policies might be useful for protecting privacy and security, and how it will drive efficiency throughout the broader economy. So I would like to invite you to, to weigh in on, um, for starters, what, what you would like to Sure. Well, Emphasize I'll, be, I'll be the last to thank our esteemed audience <laughs> for showing up today and those who are, are watching. Um, and also a shout out to FCC Commissioner Carr, who has made 5G uh, his real issue since he's joined uh, the commission as a commissioner, for being a former general counsel. But he's also helping clear the regulatory path, and that's very important uh, to the work being done. The other uh, thing of note would be my colleague at the American Enterprise Institute, Claude Barfield, writes on this topic quite a bit on the China and the trade ledger. He was not able to join us today because he's exceptionally busy, but I'd, I would point you to go see his work on our website. Um, so the, I've been in this space almost 20 years, and the one thing that always freaks out, especially lawyers, is the idea that the internet is built on trust. And you know, it's it was just this whole idea that you know, you, you know, Vint Cerf knew Steve Crocker, who knew somebody, and they kind of all wrote down these numbers, and they became the Internet Protocol System. That eventually, at some point, they had to share this ledger, which became the domain name addressing system because they couldn't quite remember them all. But at the end of the day, all of these people and the network connections are based on a a, a group of people that all trust each other. 
And so to kind of tie together the two things that have been discussed beforehand, we have this level of distrust which is coming in for varying reasons, nation state actors. You know, there's, there's, a, there's several reasons why people want your information. They want to um, you know, mitigate the way that you're managing things on the network. And then to Harold's earlier point, using the, um, I really like the uh, television analogy. I was in China in 2007 and I visited ZTE and it was a real eye-opening moment because I'm standing there as they're very proudly showing me all the things that they make and almost every single device that was in the room I owned and I thought somebody else had made it. You know, it was my HP printer, my I guess what my IBM, you know, laptop, my Motorola phone and they had proudly made all these items and it just is real awakening when you go, if somebody wanted to mess with this, this is where it would happen. It's in the chain of custody that they would have the ability to enable something in all of these devices that we happily buy off the shelves, use as part of our enterprise system that would have the capability to do something similar to the Dyn attack that happened in October of 2016, where you had a lot of inanimate objects kind of come to life and they were able to just do change their normal be pattern behavior which was being a baby monitor or maybe I don't think garage doors were, were in captive in this but they could be um, eventually when we have 5g throughout our kitchens and our homes all these devices are connected to the network at some point if you take that network connectivity and you point it at a certain direction away from just keeping the ice cubes cold um, it has the ability to create what they call a denial of service attack which is if you do enough of that it's like a really big busy signal on the internet and it stops things from happening and it, there's an overflow which means a lot of other things stop happening so that's where these two major challenges connect with each other. 5G is lightning fast. It means that we can have things like better, more efficient healthcare. We can have connected cars. We can have machine to machine capability in manufacturing. There is, if it's worked properly and networked properly, an ability to cabin off your connectivity. Um, so we were talking about this yesterday. The idea is if you're in a manufacturing space, Maybe you don't use Wi-Fi, you use some type of Bluetooth, so you shorten the distance, and that's where 5G actually excels, is in a much short, shortened distance of how it works, but it would have that ability to connect to different devices, and you wouldn't need it to have distance, you just needed to get across the room to talk to the other device. If that's designed correctly, that's great. The challenge is if there's a bunch of Huawei routers in there and I don't trust them or there's an ability for somebody to go in and, and recalibrate how those work, we may have some problems. The other thing that happened in 2007 besides visiting ZTE is the engineers that I was working with at the time at VeriSign showed up at my doorstep and said, the Chinese showed up at an IETF meeting, an Internet, edu Internet Engineering Task Force. And I said, is that not normal? And he, they said, no, they're, they're big at you know, ITU. They, they generally are not a leader. They're a follower. They wait to see what the standards are, and then they, they start building the standards. But they're never in the actual engagement of the standards process. And I was like, is this a problem? <laughs> and they said, yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it'll be interesting to see what's happening. So the point about 5G and now being engaged and wanting to really lead on that, uh, there's going to be um, you know, a, lot of, a lot of people are going to pick in this space. It's a little bit like the beta VHS game where we may end up with not the best technology, but the most expedient and first to market and the most widely adopted versus the best, which would be better quality, but it's a little higher cost. And one of the costs on that is adding security. So the, the ability to take a device and change the password on it, change anything in the network, that takes one more layer of um, software integration onto the hardware that you, you have a bunch of people that are going to plug things into their house that you want to make sure that they have the ability to control them. If these are static passwords that they cannot control on their devices, that means that anybody who can find that they're on the network and they can usually have access to them and they can, they can control them. So those are how these two areas of the challenges of China and the wonderful capabilities of 5G come together in either an amazing, uh, lovely place or a, a storm. Okay, um, we um, will go to questions from the audience in a few minutes, but I have a few other uh, questions I'd like to dig in on a little bit um, based on um, some of the comments already made. Um, people have also often noted that the first mover advantage um, in new technologies gives enormous uh, flexibility and uh, sometimes an ability to dominate an industry. Apart from the technology, the basic technology be behind 5G, 
implementing, rolling out the actual systems seems to be important. And it appears that China is devoting a fairly large amount of money. I've seen the figure 180 billion, but Carolyn used the figure that was a lot higher than that, just to build out the infrastructure. Um, my question is, are US telecom infrastructure companies um, capable of, financially capable, and are they motivated to move quickly to roll out 5G in the United States? And if we're gonna be behind the Chinese, uh, will that give their equipment makers an uh, uh, insurmountable advantage in the long run? Harold and Shane, maybe? I'm gonna step into Harold's space and then he can correct me. Um, <laughs> one of the challenges is that we will need uh, Wall Street to back the decisions that are made here. So this is where people say, what, you know, what difference does it make these decisions that are coming out of the FCC? Well, they're very important because they're an indicator to Wall Street and to investors that where are we, the path that we're on and where they should be putting their money. When we send them wobbly signals as we've been doing in other areas of the FCC where we're not sure what our our policies are, it's a challenge for these people who will need to put their money somewhere. They may put it in solar car, you know, solar or, or self-driving cars, or they can put it into a 5G network. You want to give them a solid indication that that is going to be a net positive for their investment. Um, no, I, I agree with Shane on that. I would just point out a couple of other things. One, um, equipment manufacturing is a global market. Uh, their companies all over the world purchase from the same set of manufacturers. Uh, there are, within that, national markets, so I think right now it's probably very difficult for Huawei to sell equipment in the United States. Conversely, it's, it's impossible for American manufacturers to sell equipment in, in China. Uh, in uh, 20 years ago, that would be a big advantage for the United States. Today, that's actually probably a bigger advantage for, for China. Um, uh, in this global market, uh, the uh, uh, we, we speak of 5G as if there's just one technology, or that there actually are lots of different companies with different types of components that fit into the, the 5G uh, market. Um, but I, I think uh, what has happened is the uh, uh, scale uh, that's required to be successful in the 5G manufacturing market is, is extraordinarily high. Um, and it's not clear how many companies can be profitable in that space. Um, Tom, you, you mentioned uh, first mover advantage. There are a lot of examples of that. There, there also are first mover curses. Uh, I think you could point to Japanese analog HDTV in the 1980s was a first mover curse. Um, so uh, it, it's important to be, uh, uh, look, at the end of the day in markets, good ideas, good products, good services are rewarded uh, and lesser uh, products are, are not. And we just want to be sure that the market actually works in that way and, and doesn't kind of get tilted in some other direction. Uh, Tom, may I Please. add in there, which is, uh, I, I think that there are also two other sets of challenges that US companies face, um, which is how can they compete with companies that have access to the deep pockets of the Chinese government, for one thing. Again, it's, it's, it's not fair competition. It's not a level competition. And also, what do they do? Like, uh, with the example of Qualcomm, when they have an inherent conflict um, both in trying to protect their own business interests, but also want to do business in China, which is required doing JVs, is required uh, different business decisions, and, and how do companies balance those competing interests when the Chinese government will uh, reward certain behaviors and punish other behaviors, which is not, not the way that our system works. Okay, look, um, as a person who's worked on manufacturing for a long time, um, and in an environment where our president uh, seems to be determined to return manufacturing to the United States, uh, we passed a tax bill, many of whose components were designed to 
incentivize the return of, of uh, manufacturing to the United States. Well, the model that has been used by semiconductor makers such as Qualcomm, but not only Qualcomm, Intel and others, uh, for many years was to design their chips and uh, have them produced wherever uh, they could be efficiently and cheaply produced, most inexpensively produced, let me put it that way. And that meant uh, Korea, Taiwan, and increasingly China. China is the dominant market. So I have two, two questions. If uh, essential semiconductor and other uh, connect, uh, connection devices uh, are produced in uh, China, especially since that seems to be the major problem, can the production process itself be manipulated in any way to allow uh, access uh, by the maker to the, the uh, pieces of equipment and therefore have um, access to all the billions of uh, interconnected devices that we're going to see in the 5G system. And the second part is, are, are there further ways to incentivize production in the United States so that we can plausibly suggest that some of the uh, production might might return to the United States or, say, to North America? Anybody want to tackle so that one? Our, the people challenges which will, will lead to China is that the Chinese have very good relationships with a lot of the countries that have raw materials that we need. So that which is basically China, I'm oh, sorry, Africa. So they will put investment into African infrastructure which will help bring out the, the bauxite needed for cell phones or the other materials that you need that are just, there's just a limited ability to either mine them and there's they're a finite resource. And China has, has been very long in their thought process of, of taking care of the, you know, the African government that's in charge, building airports, and that they'll go in very selfishly. That There's a reason why they're putting the airport there is to get their, their um, the things they want on the mines out, and then they leave the infrastructure behind, and then the, the society's allowed to use it if it wants. We, we're very fickle on that. Um, we have very tempered relationships with a lot of our, um, our foreign friends, especially ones that have the ability to... Uh, allow us to have some of these same mineral rights. So that is one of our challenges that, that China definitely has a leg up on us. Uh, let, let me just note a few things, Tom. Um, um, I, I think if I were advising uh, the uh, Secret State Service of China, whatever the name of it is, about how to infiltrate the United States, I, I don't think embedding devices and manufactured equipment is, is the way I would go. Look, they already, uh, uh, the uh, infiltration of the Pentagon, the infiltration of, of uh, other source, uh, other types of information in the United States by the Chinese government is, uh, has been done without uh, uh, reliance on equipment. I, I don't really think that's the way that you would uh, go about it. I, 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 I just think that's a very clumsy way, and I, I just don't think that would be uh, how it would be done. Um, the, the, the other problem you raised is, is actually something that happens every day, which is China has become the manufacturing center of the world. It's very difficult to be uh, a manufacturer outside of China uh, because all of your uh, component production is probably in China, and a lot of your uh, purchases are in China. Uh, but manufacturing in China is just a very big, very big problem. I've been on a board of an American company with manufacturing operations in China. It's just, it's very difficult to be profitable there for any number of reasons. Uh, you're always worried about uh, protection of property, both intellectual property and, and physical property. Um, and uh, it, it's um, and once you've invested there, it's really hard to get out. So uh, to get your capital out. Or? It, it's it, it's very difficult to ship manufacturing operations in from point A to point B, but once you're operating in China, it's very difficult to ship them somewhere else. So um, uh, and. and 
companies try, uh, but it's it's uh, it, it's not an easy thing to do. Tom, um, I want to sort of address the issue of backdoors, which is really what you were talking about, which is embedding embedding this thing. And I I think one of the reason there is concern is that. Um, there isn't certainty that that can't happen and won't be used. Um, and and uh, data exfiltration, uh, there was an issue with drones a few years ago that were drones were gathering information on US critical infrastructure and sending that information back to China. It's also hard to talk about this because people look at you like, you're really paranoid. I mean, this is there's something wrong with you that you are thinking that, that this is a possibility. Um, also, I think a lot of the kinds of responses, policy responses, that would help us um, meet the, the challenge of China are responses which, which people have allergic reactions to. I mean, if you talk about industrial policy, for example, a lot of people are like, well, we don't believe in industrial policy in this country, and we don't, we don't you know, the, the Chinese government has a national strategy of the industries that it wants to build. It, it, it has a plan for how it's going to support those industries, and they implement. And again, we've, we've seen that before. And then I just wanted to mention the trusted foundries issue, which is, I mean, if we are concerned enough about uh, backdoors being placed in equipment and things going on with chips, then you know, we, we should think about investing in making sure that, that parts of our infrastructure have, have equipment that we know has been produced in a way that, that is not open to compromise. Um, I, I want to mention when we talk about the Internet of Things also, you know, part of what 5G will, will do is it will facilitate smart cities. And you, know, you see these ads when you go to the airport about all of the wonders of smart cities. And indeed, they, they may well be able to make our, government work more e our governments work more efficiently and more effectively. But when, when um, governments, I'm thinking particularly of local governments, but all governments are having to go out to bid, they are going to have to, to, to go with a low-cost provider. And when you have a government like the Chinese government that is willing to underwrite the costs of production, the costs of R&D, then they can pretty much guarantee that the low-cost provider is going to be a Chinese company. That's another issue that I think that we need to face. Again, we don't think about that when we think about our traffic lights and our water that comes out of our faucet and our electricity supply. But as more and more of this is connected, I think that the risks really grow. I think that's true of consumer items as well. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of different implication when it comes to smart cities. But that, that's going back to the Dyn attack. You have all these items that are just they don't have an ability to change the password or people don't take the time to you, do it. So they're vulnerable. And once that vulnerability is in place, the, you know, between um, malware, all the different ways that you can in integrate things from the network perspective, you, you create a little army of bots that can do a lot of damage. Look, I, I think if you're going to infiltrate, you would do it through software and not through hardware. I think that's probably true, too. Right. Yeah. And so... Um, but, but I'm sure there, there probably are. I, think, I guess Harold, what, I, what I'm saying is you, if by making it cheap, you make it easier. Yeah. 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 No, that, that part is true. Uh, but infiltration through software is, is what has happened in the past. It is what is happening today. Uh, it's, it's worked, and I just, um, I, 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 I don't see that ending. And I, I think the hardware side is. Anyway, I, 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 okay. I'm skeptical. You're skeptical. Yeah. Um, w one more question, then we'll then we'll go to the audience. Uh, um, we raised the, I think Carolyn raised the the term, uh, the idea of trusted foundries. Uh, we haven't talked about um, other, uh, hopefully, allies that are. <clears throat> sometimes in the business of, of producing equipment. I mean, the Europeans, uh, Ericsson, um, Al Al Alcatel, Nokia, NXP sem semiconductors are all involved in this. Uh, Samsung is, is one of the leading uh, technology companies in the world. Are we working with them in trying to build some sorts of, sort of uh, alliances or standards, if you will, for safety 
an integrity of, of equipment uh, that Defer to my it depends on who we is in this case. It, um, we on the commercial side is different than we maybe the government. So the U.S. government is looking at using the power of the purse in the procurement process to up level the devices that each one of the agencies is, is um, purchasing with the idea that they need to have some level of protection in them. That that's still in the talking phase. Um, there's not so much in the implement implementation phase, but they are definitely discussing it. On the commercial side, you have different challenges. Well, you mentioned to me yesterday when we talked uh, that uh, Samsung especially is trying to build itself up as a trusted supplier. Yeah. Can you so the, um, the infamous dropping of the PowerPoint of the 5G, the U.S. government, you know, na national takeover of 5G, one of the groups that was sort of cheerleading that was, you know, the, if you're going to go to that paranoia and say we need to have a, a national version of 5G, it's the only way we control it, Samsung was like, choose us. <laughs> and, you know, that's an opportunity, and they took it. Um, so, you know, they, they are planning by 2020 to have every single one of the devices that they manufacture be smart. And that, again, goes to the, if the, we stay in the sunshiny part of this equation, that's fantastic. If you go to the dark side, you realize that, you know, the devices are all connected. I don't know if any of you have seen the, um, the sitcom Silicon Valley that was produced on HBO, <laughs> but at the very end, it's a smart refrigerator that saves the day. So, you know, I've told the people at Samsung, I think they're on to something. Okay, uh, why don't we go to questions from the audience. Uh, there's a gentleman in the back. Could you tell us who you are and uh, your affiliation and... Try to make the questions short and to the point. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Michael Allen. I was uh, formerly the majority staff director of the House Intelligence Committee when we did the Huawei report. And uh, hardware, sure, software is easier, but hardware is serious enough that the Defense Science Board warned about it in the supply chain recently. But my question was more about Broadcom. Um, wouldn't Broadcom, Broadcom and Qualcomm together have been put the United States in a better position to win the 5G race. Yeah, I, mean, I don't know what your views are on that. I know they were in the process of uh, redomiciling here. And then second, when will we know whether we've won or lost <laughs> and how? I mean, is it 18 months away and is it at a standard setting body or how do you know? Thanks. So I've asked that same question to people because I'm like, I'm not sure what winning means in this context. And it, it is sort of the latter, the idea that if you are able to formulate the standards process um, to a way that, the, that helps the embeddedness of how the U.S. Gov or the US um, carriers are going to manage it, I think that's their version of winning, but I have the same question. I'm not quite sure what that means. Uh, I, I would go back to whether they can compete or not. If, if there's a meaningful market that they can compete in, then I think they're winning if if essentially the market is foreclosed because everyone in the world has already decided they're they're buying Huawei, then I think that's that's problematic. Um, uh, so I, I think that's kind of how I would define it. The timing, uh, I don't know. Uh, it, it's not that there's a single 5G technology. It's not that the 5G technology that AT and T and Verizon are going to roll out next year is the ultimate end game for 5G. 5G is going to take place in a lot of different bands of technology, each of which are going to require their own separate type of manufacturing of equipment. And uh, it's conceivable you could have different companies participate in, in different areas of 5G. Uh, I think the concern is that it wind up as, as a monopoly uh, and I think if, it, if that were to happen, that would be very bad for consumers, not just in the United States, but all over the world. Um, well, I, first, congratulations and thank you on that, the report that you guys did um, on Huawei. Uh, I think uh, to take it to kind of a slightly different place, that there are a lot of business school case studies that have uh, determined that acquisitions uh, mergers and acquisitions, but that they don't necessarily uh, meet with the commercial success that that was originally proposed when the takeovers were happening. And I think that I mean I have a copy of the of the letter that Cifia sent, um, but I think that that there were le legitimate concerns about the weakening of Qualcomm 
um, through through this kind of activity that that you know I mean I I commend the administration much as I might disagree with them on a lot of things but I commend the administration for actually taking some steps on some of these things to try to address some of the some of the concerns and also you know it, it's an interesting question that you ask about when will we know if we're successful because it's not as though technological innovation has an end point, it keeps happening, which is why I said when I questioned the numbers the, about how many jobs there would be and how much money by 2035, we don't know what kind of disruptive technologies are out there that might change the landscape completely. So it's, it's, it's to me, it's, it's always going towards a horizon. It's not as though there will be a point at which you can declare success and say, uh, okay, we're done. We're going to, we're going to retire and do something else. Uh, I'll just, say two quick things about Broadcom, Qualcomm. Uh, one is clearly there were those in the administration uh, who felt that there were security related questions um, related to Broadcom. Um, I have no insight into that. I have no clearances, um, but they apparently felt strongly enough to block the deal. Second, um, just a speculation pure speculation on my part, if Broadcom actually does have the alleged ties in China, mm -hmm. an interesting indicator might be if they use their anti-monopoly authority to block Qualcomm's acquisition of NXP semiconductor, which is a key to the future, or at least Qualcomm thinks it's the key to their future economic success. So they have that tool available to them, which might possibly be linked to the Broadcom decision. So we'll, we'll see if it even reaches that stage. I'm not sure that the NXP stockholders are, are agree that Qualcomm has made a sufficient bid, but it'll be interesting to see if it okay. gets to that um, stage. Let's see, we have a question up front here. Hi, I'm Charles Harvey. I'm a senior advisor at America Defense International. You know, people keep on talking about continuing to win the 5G race. Didn't we already lose it? I mean, isn't Ericsson, Nokia have like 90 plus percent market share of the infrastructure in 5G going forward for the US deployments for our big four operators? And going to the future, how do you think the US can compete with the Chinese outspending us 30 to one on you know, quantum encryption in the quantum future? Oh, that's a big one. <laughs> Let me just, <laughs> the, the different segments of the market, uh, Ericsson and Nokia are in what I would call the uh, network equipment market, and uh, particularly because Huawei can't really sell much in the United States, uh, it's not surprising that uh, Nokia and Ericsson would be the dominant providers. There really are just four network equipment providers in the world of any significance, those three, uh, plus Alcatel, Lucent. Um, the the real innovation, if you will, goes on at the uh, uh, microprocessor semiconductor level, uh, and that's where you have competition among uh, Samsung, uh, Huawei, Qualcomm on the uh, the mobile side, and then uh, with some there probably are a half dozen other major semiconductor manufacturers heavily much more on the fixed side than on the mobile side. Uh, but their products then get purchased by the likes of Ericsson and Nokia uh, for uh, uh, aggregating into to the transceiver boxes that, that become the network equipment. Carolyn, yeah. Quantum, <laughs> which is um, yeah another real challenge. And I mentioned AI earlier. But I, I think just to address your, your quantum question, I, I believe that we have, uh, as, a, as a nation, got to increase the investments that we make in R&D for quantum. I mean, we have got to increase our investments in high-speed computing. We've got to increase our investments in education and training of scientists. And I think that if we don't do that, we, we are we, ha we have lost the race even on quantum before it even really gets started. So and I, to me, again, that's an, a lot of people have allergic reaction to, to government spending on these things, but I think that we really must commit to, uh, and commit, not be fickle, but commit to a program of, of spending on this. 
And if the Chinese win on quantum, they're not going to share. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, and the national security implications of that are so significant. Yeah. And they're making strides. I mean, they are making big strides. I have a question on the aisle here. Hi, uh, John Feroldi from Charter Communications. Uh, the question is regarding 5G and the, it's being ubiquitous throughout the world. Do you think that IPv6 will finally be adopted in the United States? So IPv6 is, I mean, yeah, I mean, yes, we'll, we'll, we'll encourage it, yes, because you're going to need more numbers. I mean, it's just a, a math problem there. Can you explain to the rest of us <laughs> what, what that is? <laughs> so I, IPv4 is what uh, quite, a, quite a bit, I and mean, we do have some infrastructure that's running on, on IPv6. It's Internet Protocol version 4. Don't yeah. ever ask what happened to 5. No one thinks yeah. that's funny. I don't know myself. I learned not to ask. Um, apparently, there was a bad accident. I'm kidding. Um, so IPv4 is just a, a way. It's the, the alphanumeric way that they, or the number of ways that the system uses itself. By IPv6, they figured out how to put an exponential in place. So we thought we had infinity when we had just basically big companies in the government that were able to run large computers. And then everybody got a computer in their hand, and we needed a lot more of these internet protocol numbers, which are the, the number that connects them. So they created, again, don't ask about five, jump to six. Uh, but there has not been as wide of an adoption. And one of the reasons why there was a slowdown in the adoption of IPv6 actually was the um, 2008 um, financial crisis. Mm -hmm. You just didn't have as many people you know, investing in new equipment because they needed a change where they manage their money to. So you didn't see the adoption quite as quickly, and then that meant maybe you needed, maybe you didn't need to do it as fast. There's also been ways that people have been able to manipulate the IPv4 number just to keep them and you know move them around in the market. But we are gonna need an exceptional amount of numbers, so I think we'll, we will see IPv6 coming into much faster adoption. We had a question up front here. Hi, I'm Howard Buskirk with Communications Daily. I wanted to ask, so we had the Trump administration, there was some kind of document, I think, somewhat famously a couple months ago about 5G and how they were going to launch some kind of 5G network, which nobody really understood. And um, what do you see as the mindset of this administration right now in terms of competitiveness and, you know, the problems with China and, you know, w what direction, like, what, 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 what do you, how much more do you s foresee coming out of this administration you know, aimed at competitiveness, like some of the recent um, policy calls? Well, I th as always, I would say to, to get the views of the administration, you need to ask the administration. I can only give you an interpretation of what I, of what I read that everybody else is reading. But uh, I think that the president, uh, the, the, there's the possibility that the president will announce, what are they saying, uh, $60 billion potentially of tariffs, possibly on Friday. I think we all have grown to realize that announcements don't necessarily come when people say they're going to come, and they don't necessarily say what they're going to say. Um, I, I will say, though, on the on the 5G proposal that sort of was floated and sank or was leaked and sank is that um, I, I don't think that it was given a fair hearing. I mean, I think that whoever put it out put it out for the reason that they wanted it to be shot down. Um, and that there were, you know, there are some serious and legitimate questions that should be asked as we consider what the policy responses should be. But, I mean, I, you know, the, the the president himself has talked about the need for taking action on on China's unfair trade practices. So, I, mean, I think you have to see what unfolds, but talk to the administration about that. That was not a very satisfactory answer, but <laughs> a couple. Of, one thing is, I thought that Judge Green answered that question back in 1984. Um, with the break of at and <laughs> it kind of felt like we were heading right back there. You're like, didn't we decide that that wasn't the path we wanted to go on? Um, and then I think the other question, I realize that this is an international panel, but you know, the, the administration can decide what they want. Uh, when I mentioned Commissioner Carr, one of the things that you know, at least we're seeing is that they're realizing for all this to become true and real, we need to make decisions actually at the local level just as much as we do at the international level to move forward on this. I mean, we've seen this to an example would be Verizon in Virginia. They went to Alexandria. They wanted to make it expensive, tough to dig. So Verizon said, you know, money flows where it goes easiest, and they moved on. They still don't have Fios in Alexandria, as far as I know. They have it. I had it in Alexandria. It was great. They have it in Fairfax. But you know, they, they made it easy for them to implement it there. So there's there's a couple layers to the question about what we're going to do from an 
uh, government side on 5G. Just on my, my impression on, on, is that if you look at the personnel that they've put in place in USTR, Commerce, White House, um, and uh, read the president's own statements, they're dead serious about doing what they can to promote manufacturing coming back to this country and not to treat China the way it's been treated in the past. The wild card in all of this, as it is in every administration uh, since Reagan, I think, will the Chinese actions purportedly to support U.S. foreign policy goals, such as in North Korea, cause them to outweigh their in inclinations, their strong inclinations to um, be very uh, seriously engaged with reducing Chinese uh, influence and uh, calling, them, calling their bluff on their uh, mercantilist trade policies. So I think, <clears throat> do we have any more questions? Uh, let's make this the last question. And uh... hi, uh, Tom Struble with R Street Institute. Uh, so I think there's you know reasonable room for disagreement as to whether China's current posturing is a threat or how big of a threat they are. But I think we would all agree that if China maintains their dominance in manufacturing and also becomes dominant in the standard settings process, then we would have a problem on our hands because they can stifle competition and insert back doors and technology for national security reasons. Basically, that would be a problem. Uh, so if we want to avoid that outcome, do I guess, and putting aside whether we could take back manufacturing jobs through automation, that's an interesting question, but I guess focusing on standard setting, because um, I think that was a big part of the uh, CFIUS decision to block the Broadcom acquisition of Qualcomm uh, was, at least this was Ben Thompson's take on Stratechery afterwards, was that Broadcom probably would have shut down or at least scaled back Qualcomm's R&D, which might not affect the 5G standard setting process as much because release 15 is already done, 16 is underway, but going forward into 6G and beyond, that would be a big problem because it would mean U.S. leadership at the standard settings process is scaled back and China might become dominant there. So in terms of how to, I guess, ensure the U.S. stays a leader, if not the leader, in standard setting. What, I guess, would you think is the best sort of uh, strategy for achieving that? Is it using sort of soft political influence with our friends in you know, Korea and Japan and Europe to try and ensure that they don't let China become dominant in that? Or do you think more formal measures are uh, required here, such as, I think, the idea of tariffs on uh, Huawei and ZTE equipment was floated last week? Uh, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I'll take it. Yes, standards. Let me just mention a couple things. Uh, first of all, uh, we're nowhere near the end of the 5G standard setting process. We're really still at the first stages. Um, so the the 5G decisions for lots of parts of 5G have, have not been done yet. I think what I'm hearing from a lot of people is the, the problem uh, – the way standard setting bodies have operated in the past is, and I've sat in on some of these, you, you, get, you get a bunch of engineers in a room and uh, they talk about the technology and uh, they're probably about the only people in the world who would understand exactly what they're talking about. Um, and it's, it's kind of a collegial old boy network. A lot of the people in the room know everybody and, and uh, uh, their disputes and uh, they try to work through uh, some form of consensus to, to reach some standard set, some standard. Um, and what has happened particularly with 5G uh, and uh, Shane was starting to talk about this in 4G as well is it, it has become very politicized. It really has become very politicized with massive delegations, uh, particularly from Huawei, going to standard setting bodies. And, and when you're working on consensus and you've got, instead of just uh, two dozen people in a room, and suddenly you've got 2,000 and 1,000 of them are from one company, <laughs> it, it, it has a very different dynamic to it. And, and so I... I I do wonder whether the 
way in which standards have been set in the past uh, continues to make sense when that process uh, becomes politicized in the way it has. And I, I don't, I mean, Shane, Carolyn, maybe you all know people who are actually working on this. Huh? Shane, you might. I, I don't know people who are working on it. But I, I don't, I, it's, it's interesting, of course, that you point to Huawei, which is, as I mentioned when I first spoke, was that um, I think that the, that the Chinese government has learned where it has been successful in international fora and where it has not, and is applying those lessons. And so recognizing that getting engaged on these bodies is an important thing for them to do in order for them to be successful the way that they are. They also have been willing, I don't know if it's happened in these bodies yet, but they have been willing to pull other strings in order to accomplish what it is that, with, that, that they want to accomplish. So they can identify um, people from other countries that might have other interests, use those interests as a way to influence the decisions that are being made. So it's, 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 um, it's a way of, I'll use a way of doing diplomacy uh, or coercion or influence peddling or something like that. And I, I don't know, but I have to presume that something quite similar is probably happening in these standard setting bodies. Yeah. As I sit here with my I triple E, I'm a, I'm a groupie. <laughs> I, just, I just admire their work. Um, you understand it. <laughs> I, I do, uh, but I, you know, it's I'm a, I do it as a voyeur. But part of what's interesting, and you've just led on to that, is the geopolitical nature of it. That you know, the, the engineers usually by their nature just want to solve problems, yeah. and so you know, the, you get a bunch of them in the room, which is why consensus works. They're like, if you just have that one guy, if he starts to make sense, they'll move. Like, okay, that's not going to work for these reasons. But if they get to you know a point where the technology is going to work, and the only problem is going to be one outlier thing, they'll usually be able to move forward. When you put the geopolitical nature of these things in place, it gets really interesting because now all of a sudden the the weight and measure of the process changes as to, you know, how people come in the room. And we, we are engaged in this with the U.S. government as well. There's um, so many things that start with the letter W. There's a WSIS process that's going on right now in Geneva. You know, that, so there's tiering in this. And, and the other challenge we have is we still are running telecom and internet policy in parallel paths. This is really the first time we're going to see these guys need to totally commingle. Um, you know, years ago I was asking, I was at an internet governance forum, and I said, what's, what's the country code for Nigeria? And somebody gave me their area code. And of course, I'm thinking internet protocol numbers. So that just showed to me, I was like, oh, wait, I, needed to, I wanted to know dot .nr or whatever it was. They were, said 802. And I was like, OK, we just had a moment where we were not thinking in the same way here. And so um, that is another one of our challenges. And when you put government might behind that, it becomes easily influenced to go one direction. OK, please join me in thanking our panelists for a wonderful